It's in a beautiful song set as we reflect upon the victory of the cross, as we rejoice in a resurrected Savior. Um, what a beautiful time, what a great privilege it is to worship the Lord together in song. I just want to take an opportunity this morning to thank all of those folk who are a part of our prayer ministry. Um, they're, they're folk who receive our prayer and praise focus every week, and they faithfully pray for people both within and outside of this congregation. Uh, they're people who, on a Sunday morning, while the preacher is preaching, they're folk who are rostered, and they're in the uh, reception area praying through uh, our meeting time. They're folk who meet um, on a Sunday morning at 8 o'clock uh, to pray. They're folk who come here at half past five on a Tuesday afternoon, and they too are found in prayer. Uh, the elders ourselves meet at half past seven on a Sunday morning. So I just want to say thanks to those folk who are a part of that prayer ministry. They're also folk who pray for people after the meeting every Sunday. And I just want to say thanks to you guys, and I appreciate your ministry. Uh, have you guys noticed... Uh, and we've got a new sign as you go out into the mission field. Did you guys notice that? Do you guys like it? Does he get a thumbs up? Okay, well, uh, I saw him just now. That good-looking man, uh, no, no, not Steve Martin, the other good-looking guy sitting next to him. Well, Craig Martin's the guy who put that all together for us. So let's give him a round of applause for just a beautiful job. Well done. And he's really captured the heart of what it means to go and to be the church. Okay, there's a gray Isuzu um, Registration plate ADV 7235, parked right behind the church near the office block. Is that correct? Okay, so parked up here, and your alarm is going off. Okay, so Gray Isuzu ADV 7235. All right. Okay, why don't you turn with me in your Bibles to the Gospel of Luke chapter 7 this morning. Luke chapter 7 and... We're going to start from verse 36. While you're turning there, just a reminder, we're going to have uh, some tea and coffee, some cappuccinos available uh, this morning after the meeting, so please don't rush away. Come and join us alongside the hall here. Come and uh, enjoy some fellowship with us. Are we going to have um, voice rolls? Okay, and there are voice rolls available as well. Okay. And thank you for your continued support of that AFJ ministry and all the proceeds that we collect from that go back into the Adventure for Jesus, which is the branch of our young people's ministry uh, here at uh, BBC. Okay, so you're turning to Luke chapter 7, verse, uh, verse 36. Uh, chapter 7, verse 36, we're in the parables of Jesus um, in, uh, in our series titled The Pearls of Parables. We've come to the 11th part of our series this morning. If you've missed out on any of that and you want to get a hold of it, you can, uh, you can check it out on YouTube or you can get a hold of the office and they can uh, email you an audio of uh, the previous 10 uh, or whichever one you may have missed out on. And so this morning we come to the 11th part of our series on the pearls of parables and today's parable is going to be titled Parable of Worship Worshipful Love. Parable of Worshipful Love. Do you have a different title in your Bible? You probably have the title in, in verse 40, right? Parable of the two debtors. Anyone, anyone got a title? None of you? Okay, so it's only my Bible, hey? Sure, you guys really need to upgrade. <laughs> no, I'm only kidding. Okay, so my Bible titles it the parable of the two great debtors, but I'd like to suggest to you that it is, it is the parable of worshipful love. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads as we pray together. Father, we come reverently before your word this morning, recognizing that your word is power and your word is truth. And when we're confronted by truth, Lord, as we are honest with ourselves and honest with you, it is a truth that sets us free. And as we're confronted by your word, we find a grace and a mercy that comes running after sinners like us. And so as we come before your word today, I ask you, Jesus, that you would make our eyes to see and our ears to hear, our minds to understand, and our hearts to receive your word today. That we might prove by experience that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. In Jesus, nothing of me and everything of you, I pray, to the praise of the glory of your grace. Amen. 
Okay, so we're in Luke uh, chapter 7. We're going to be reading verses 36 to 50. Now, in your Bibles, you, you may think that this parable starts in verse 40, but in order for us to understand the context of what's going on, we have to go back to verse 36. I'm going to ask you to follow with me in your Bibles. I'm reading from the New King James Version, but you follow Luke chapter 7, verse 36. Then one of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him. He went to the Pharisee's house and sat down to eat. And behold, a woman in the city who was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at the table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of fragrant oil and stood at his feet behind him weeping. And she began to wash his feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head. And she kissed his feet and anointed them with the fragrant oil. And when the Pharisees who had invited him saw this, he spoke to himself, saying, This man, if he were a prophet, would know who and what manner of woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner. In verse 40, And Jesus answered and said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. And so he said, Teacher, say it. There was a certain creditor who had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. And when they had nothing with which to repay, he freely forgave them both. Tell me, Simon, which of them will love him more? Simon answered and said, Well, I suppose the one whom he forgave more. And he said to him, You have rightly judged. And then he turned to the woman and said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I entered your house and you gave me no water for my feet. But she has washed my feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head. You gave me no kiss. But this woman has not ceased to kiss my feet since the time that I came in. You did not anoint my head with oil, but this woman has anointed my feet with fragrant oil. Therefore I say to you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. In verse 48, and then he said to her, your sins are forgiven. And those who sat at the table with him began to say to themselves, Who is this who even forgives sins? In verse 50, And then he said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. And the heart of today's message is this, church. When we understand the great love of God, we will have a great love for God and for others. When we understand the great love of God, we will have a great love for God and for others. And so, to understand this parable, as I've already said, we've got to go some verses back to this encounter of this woman anointing the feet of Jesus. And so, uh, we find that uh, as the story unfolds, there's a Pharisee who invites Jesus to a meal with him. Now remember that the Pharisees who were the guys who were criticizing Jesus for hanging out with sinners and with tax collectors. In fact, they had even turned around and said, because wherever, wherever Jesus was invited, he went. Whoever invited him, he went to their home. Didn't matter who they were. Didn't matter what kind of reputation they had. Didn't matter whether the community thought they were important or not. Whenever Jesus was invited, he went. And so the Pharisees turned around and they actually went as far as to call him a drunkard and a glutton. You just don't know how to turn down an invitation. You're just out for a good time. You're nothing but a drunkard and a glutton. And so these Pharisees have already labeled Jesus. They already have a strong opinion about who Jesus is. And this Pharisee has the audacity to come to Jesus and say, why don't you come over to my place for a meal? Does Jesus turn around and say, I'm not, going to, I'm not hanging around with you? Not after all the things that you label me as. No, Jesus takes up his invitation to a meal. Because Jesus came to seek and save the sinners and the tax collectors and the religious sinners like the scribes and the Pharisees. And so Jesus says, sure, I'll come to your place for a meal. Now, what we need to understand here, on the surface, it seems as though this Pharisee is a good guy. It seems as though he's finally softening to the ministry of Christ, 
seems as though he dares to go against the grain of the other scribes and Pharisees who just ridicule and mock Christ. But this guy seems to be bold enough to step out there and say, you know what, I'm actually going to invite this guy over to my house. And it seems to be a noble thing that he's doing. But it's not a noble thing. I'd like to suggest to you that this Pharisee only invites Jesus to his home because he wants to size him up. He wants to check him out. He wants to understand who he is and what he's about. That's the only reason that he invites Jesus to his home. There's nothing noble. There's nothing sincere. There's nothing genuine about him bringing Jesus over to his home for a meal. And so this guy, and his name is Simon, he's part of this elite, close-knit group of Pharisees who believe that they've got it all figured out, who believe that they've got it all together, and they set this, they, they, they set this uh, bunch of rules and this bunch of regulation. They turn around and say to the people, you need to adhere to this. You need to follow the way we live. And in fact, um, so strong was their opinion of Jesus. If we go back in Luke chapter 5, Jesus heals a paralytic man. And he heals him of his sin. He forgives him of his sin. And get a hold of this. Jesus turns around and says, says in Luke chapter 5, he says, your sins are forgiven you. The scribes and the Pharisees begin to reason. They turn around and say, who is this who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sin but God? That's how strong their hostility was against Jesus. Who does he think he is to forgive sin. This is blasphemous. The only person who can forgive sin is God. And so the Pharisees and the scribes had already, already decided that Jesus was a blasphemer. They already decided that, that, uh, that, that, that he was false because, he had, he, because of his claims to be God. And so they were, they were intent on finding incriminating evidence against him. And that's why I believe that they probably all got together and they said to this Pharisee, why don't you invite him over to your house? Let's get incriminating evidence against him and then we can justify our reason for acting the way that we act. And so Jesus says, sure, Simon, I'll come to your house for a meal. Now understand that in those days, people wouldn't sit around a dining room table on dining room chairs as we would today. But what would happen is a, a low table would be set before the guests, and there would be these long couches that would be pushed up against the table. They didn't have any backs. They didn't have any sides. It was just a soft couch. And the guests would actually recline at the table while they're having a meal. Another thing is it wasn't short meals, okay? It wasn't just a couple of hours, okay, cheers, we'll see you later. These things went on for hours and hours and hours because it was a time for people to engage in conversation. Very different culture to our culture. In fact, as I read this, I think that that would have really frustrated uh, my parents and my grandmother slouching at the table while you're eating, right? You get a clap over their head and sit up straight when you eat. Well, they didn't do that, okay? They would recline and they'd kind of lean on, on one elbow and they'd have a meal together, and then they'd sit around and conversation would take place. Another thing that we need to understand in these times is that uh, the important people were invited to a special meal. But the peasants and the plebs weren't. The uninvited guests weren't invited uh, to these special meals. However, there was an open invitation for them to come and be witnesses to the meal. So what would often happen is the meal would often be held in an open-style courtyard area. The table would be in the center there, and people would recline on their couches, and they would gather around for this meal, and people from the town and people from the village would all come around, and they'd make their way in quietly, and they'd all stand around this courtyard area. Now remember, they had no DSTV then, and they had no radios, and they had no TVs, and they had no newspapers, so they came just to hear what was going on here. They came to glean a little bit of information. They claimed, came to glean a little bit of wisdom because the important people are having a meal. Imagine how awkward that is. You're feasting on your meal and these bunch of peasants gathering around watching you eat. Okay, And, and amongst those people would be the poor who would come hoping that they could gather a little bit of scraps off the table so that they might take that food home to feed their families for the night. And so Jesus is sitting at this table not only with Simon the Pharisee, but uh, I, I suspect that there would have been other Pharisees, there would have been other guests who were around the table. And so people come around and they gather quietly in the shadows there, uh, kind of just for amusement. And so, uh, and so this, the story is unfolding as these people are having this meal. And then in the middle of the meal, Luke tells us that a woman appears on the scene. And get a hold of how she's described a woman in the city who was a sinner. Kind of sounds harsh of Luke, doesn't it? Luke, surely you could have 
put that in a nicer way? Surely you could have made more of an effort to describe this woman. I don't believe it was Luke's intention to judge her. I think it was Luke's intention for us to understand the character of the woman who had entered into the courtyard that day. And I think Luke felt that he was being kind because he doesn't come out and say, a woman of the streets, a woman of the night, a prostitute. He says, a woman who was a sinner. Now let me just say this real quick just for your information's sake. We must not confuse this account with a similar account we find in Matthew, Mark, and John. Okay, in Matthew, Mark, and John, we find a woman by the name of Mary who comes to anoint the head of Jesus. This woman anoints the feet of Jesus and she remains an unnamed woman. You can find those accounts in, in Matthew 26, Mark 14, and John 12 is where you'll find those stories. So don't confuse these stories. And so I want you to imagine with me the scene that day. This woman enters into, she appears on our scene. And she comes in quietly, and she comes in unobtrusively. And she makes her way past the people, and she's looking for one person and one person only. She's looking for Jesus. But this is a woman who's known by the town. This is a woman who gets chins wagging. This is a woman who gets gossip going. And imagine that scene as she humbly just pushes past this, this mass of a crowd who have gathered to watch this meal unfold. Imagine people nudging one another and saying, what is she doing here? Imagine people shaking their heads, and just murmuring and muttering under their breath. Who does she think she is to come in here? Imagine people stepping away from her in disgust so that she doesn't brush up against them. And yet this woman doesn't care. She's looking for Jesus. Now you see, the whole community were invited to come and be spectators to this meal. But this woman would never have been allowed to be there. She should not have been there. In her being there, she was defiling the house of a religious Pharisee, an upright man, a so-called pious, godly man, defiling his home. She's a prostitute. She should be on the street, not in a Pharisee's home. Under normal circumstances, Simon and this woman would never, ever meet because he'd never hang out with a woman like her and she'd never hang out with a guy like him. They were from opposite spectrums of life. And yet Jesus beautifully crafts this story to make sure that Simon is there and this sinful woman is there because he is about to teach a profound spiritual reality. She, church, she knows she's a sinner, but she doesn't care. She doesn't care about anybody else. She only cares about what Jesus has to say. Imagine that. The whole town knows her story. Her dirty laundry is hanging up there for everybody to see. Let me ask you a question. If you arrived here today, and by some means and in some way, people were able to know my hidden sin, People were able to know my cherished sin. If there were a bubble above my head that, that, that flashed out the sins I've committed, would I come here today? No, I wouldn't. If you knew my sin, I would not come to a public gathering like this. Would you? If we knew what you've done, would you come here? And yet this woman knew that she was a sinner. And she dared to face the mockery and the scorn and the contempt of people. But she didn't care. She was looking for Jesus. And there was nothing that was going to keep her from coming to Jesus. So we understand that about history. Another thing that we need to understand about history is perfume played a big part in the lives 
of women in the lives of Jewish women. So often what women would do, in fact, all women would walk around with a, a leather strap uh, around their, their necks, and on the end of that would be a vial of perfume that they would carry around with them. But the Bible tells us that this woman didn't just bring a little vial of perfume. She brought a whole alabaster, alabaster flask. Uh, it was a flask that contained not just fragrant oil, it was a flask that contained costly, costly perfume. And no doubt she made it from her trade. No doubt she saved a lot of money to buy this costly perfume and this alabaster flask. It was a flask that would be crafted uh, from, uh, from fine, uh, intricate marble that would come from Egypt. It would be a narrow flask, and then the neck would, would thin out. It would be cylindrical, and it would be sealed off so that the perfume wouldn't spill out. And, uh, and when a person wanted to use it, you would, you would snap this thin cylindrical neck, and then you would pour out this perfume. And so this unnamed woman finally finds Jesus around the table. And she stands behind him. And she starts to weep. She starts to weep at the feet of Jesus. And I think it was a combination of the reality of who she was and the reality of who Jesus was. And as these two realities collided, this woman comes apart at the seams. But friends, I want to tell you that she doesn't, she doesn't weep like Hollywood actresses weep. You know, when they're kind of just trying to push out that one tear. She sobs uncontrollably. It's the Greek word breko. It actually means to weep like rain. She sobbed uncontrollably as she stood at the feet of Jesus. Doesn't care what people are saying and no doubt people are muttering and no doubt people are talking and no doubt people are shaking their heads at her and looking at her in disgust. And she weeps uncontrollably. And then she lets down a big mistake. She lets down her hair. Now, firstly, she has wept enough tears to wash the feet of Jesus. We're not talking a couple of tears. We're not talking a dozen or so tears. We're talking a flood of tears. And she lets down her hair, and she starts to wipe the feet of Jesus. In those customs and those times, women were forbidden from letting their hair down. It was a sign of looseness. It was a sign of poor... Um, uh, moral value. And in fact, these religious scribes and Pharisees had even gone so far as to create their own law, which suggested that if a woman let her hair down in public, it was grounds for divorce. Disgusting, isn't it? These religious rabbis. You let your hair down in public, your husband can divorce you. And this unnamed woman knew that she was taking a risk. She let her hair down. She got her face right up in the feet of Jesus and she dried his feet with her hair. And you can imagine the crowd watching this in horror and disgust and thinking, what is she doing? She shouldn't even be here. Jesus really needs to get a hold of himself. And you know what? Simon really needs to do something because he's embarrassing himself. This is disgusting. Everybody's going to be talking about Simon the Pharisee after this and how he let this woman come in here. He really needs ought to get his servants out there to do something about it. And I can imagine Simon's servant stepping forward to do something about it. And Simon probably just holding him back and saying, no, no, no. I want to see how this unfolds. Leave it. I, this is the incriminating evidence we want against him. Let it happen. Don't stop it. She takes the alabaster, alabaster flask and she breaks the neck and then she pours this costly, expensive, extravagant uh, perfume over the feet of Jesus. And its scent starts to fill the courtyard. And imagine what people must have been saying. What would you have said if she started pouring this perfume? What a waste. Would you have said that? What a waste. 
of good, expensive perfume. What a waste. And yet she wastefully, worshipfully, extravagantly pours this perfume over the feet of Jesus. And I can imagine Jesus looking across the table and his eyes meet with Simon's eyes. And Simon looks on Jesus with contempt. And I can imagine Simon shifting his eyes to the woman at the feet of Jesus and looking upon her with disgust. I'm disgusted by your behavior. The audacity to come into my house as a woman of the night and mess up my party. I'm disgusted. Verse 39, now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he spoke to himself saying, this man, if he were a prophet, would know who and what manner of woman this is. It's almost like saying this thing is. Who is touching him? For she is a sinner. So Simon's looking across, and he puts it all down to ignorance. Okay, he's, he's ignorant. He's oblivious to the fact that this woman is a prostitute. He obviously doesn't know. And so he's just, he's just ignorant. I'm, I'm going to ex- excuse him on the grounds of ignorance. Because if he really were a prophet, he would know who this woman was. He would never have let her come near him. He would never have let her touch him. No sensible religious leader, no one who was claiming to be a prophet of God, no one who was claiming to be the Messiah would ever let this woman come near him. So he obviously isn't a prophet, and he obviously isn't the Messiah. And this is the evidence that we want to pacify our hearts. And in that moment, Simon starts to to deduce things in his own mind. He says, if Jesus were a prophet, he would know the character of this woman. And if he were a prophet, he would never let her come near him. So since Jesus is okay with her doing this, he obviously doesn't know her character. He obviously doesn't know that she is a sinner, and therefore he obviously is no prophet at all. And we as scribes and Pharisees are justified in our opinion. Case closed. It's exactly what we wanted to find out. Case closed. You see, because the work of prophets, prophets were sent by God to tell us what we don't know, right? The Simon's sitting there and saying, well, he obviously doesn't know what's going on here. Therefore, he cannot be a prophet. And that works just good for me. Because that's our whole issue with this man. He's nothing but a blasphemer. Now, up until now, this scene has unfolded in silence. No one has spoken, except for the murmurs and the gasps and maybe the little bit of chin-wagging that's going on on the side. And then, and then finally, someone speaks, and it's Jesus. And Jesus answered and said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. What does the Bible say? Jesus what? Answered. You answer a question. Did Simon ask a question? Simon didn't ask a question, right? Which tells us what? Jesus knew his heart. Not that Jesus heard him, because I can just imagine how he was muttering under his breath. He's no prophet at all. Jesus answers an unasked question. Can you imagine how Simon must have blushed over? Can you imagine how embarrassing that must have been? Simon, I know exactly what you're thinking. It's embarrassing when, when you know you've been found out, right? Your parents ever do that to you? When they know, and they say, I know exactly what you, what you think. Or I know that you're lying to me. And you deny it, and you start to blush over it. And, and then you just give yourself away. And Jesus turned around and says, I know exactly what you're thinking. And I have an answer for you. I've got something to say to you. What does Simon say to Jesus? He's just all cocky and arrogant. Turns around and says, Rabbi, say it. Go ahead. There is nothing you can say to come back from this mess. You, you've already made your bed, Jesus. Go for it. Say what you want to say. You look like a fool today, not me. Say it. And Jesus says to him, I want to tell you a story of two debtors who owed money. He says one owed 500 denarii and the other owed 50. 
And when they could not pay, the creditor forgave them. Tell me, who's going to love him more? Who will love him more? And he turns around, and I almost sense sarcasm here. Almost like you're insulting my intelligence. It's almost as though Jesus were asking Simon, Simon, what's one plus one? You're insulting my intelligence. The sarcasm. Well, I suppose the one whom he forgave more, of course. It's a no-brainer. Of course the one who owed five denarii is going to be more grateful than the one who owed 50. Of course. What a stupid question. Don't insult my intelligence. I'm Simon the Pharisee. And right now, Jesus, things are not looking good for you. So you better slack off here. And Jesus says, you have rightly judged. For a change, actually. <laughs> Pharisees were poor a judge of character, he finally judged right. Jesus said, yeah, you finally got it right. Well done. And then Jesus turns to this, to this broken woman who's just lavished this worshipful, extravagant love over him. And then he asks Simon another question, another insulting question. Simon, do you see this woman? Simon's thinking, you, you're, you're really making a mockery of me. Of course I see her. Who doesn't see her? I've had my eyes on her from the time she came in here because she shouldn't be in here. This is my home. This is my party. You're my guest. Of course I've seen her. What do you mean have you seen this woman? Of course I've seen her. And then Jesus draws a comparison between Simon and the Pharisee. The self-righteous, proud, pious, religious man and the sinful prostitute of the town. Jesus draws this comparison. He says, there's no difference between you and this woman. The only difference is she recognizes that she's a sinner. That's the difference. And then Jesus argues something out with Simon, and he challenges Simon on the grounds of what this woman has just done. And he doesn't use, ground, he doesn't use grounds of religiosity. He doesn't use grounds of law. He just uses the grounds of simple acts of kindness. He says, Simon, I entered into your house as your guest, and you gave me no water to wash my feet. In those times, if you invited someone to your house as a guest, you made sure that there was a servant at the door to wash their feet. People walked around in sandals, all in the dust and the muck and the grime, and so you needed to clean those feet, especially if you're reclining at a table where this person's lying there and their feet are all up in your face, and you're lying next to them and your feet are all up in their face, right? You've got to have clean feet. And so you'd have a servant there to wash their feet. There was no servant to wash Jesus' feet. It was disgusting behavior on the part of Simon, which shows he wasn't even sincere. He didn't really want Jesus to be there as an, on, an honored guest. He says, you did nothing. He says, but this woman comes in and she washes my feet with her tears. You didn't even have a servant waiting there with a towel to dry my feet. She let her hair down knowing what it would cost her in the eyes of society. She dried my feet with her hair. He says, you did not welcome me with a kiss, which was common practice. It's kind of the picture of the prodigal son and the, and the father. As the father falls down and the son kisses him on the neck. He said, you didn't even greet me like that. It's kind of like today going to a friend's house. He doesn't greet you. doesn't shake your hand. doesn't give you a hug. You start asking, did I get the wrong memo? Am I at the right house? Did, did this guy not invite me to his house? Well, he sure, he sure isn't acting like that. He says, you didn't welcome me with a kiss. He says, but from the time I came into your house, this woman has not stopped kissing my feet. Another thing that was, that was customary is it was common for a, for, a, um, for a person to anoint the head of their guest with oil. He says, you never anointed my head with oil. It says, but this woman anointed my feet with this costly, fragrant perfume. Simon, everything that you should have done as my host yet failed to do, this woman whom you look upon with disgust has done it all. She's done everything. And you see, Simon, she's the one who owed 500 denarii, and you're the one who owes 50. She has understood my great love. 
And it's as though at that moment, Simon the Pharisee's walls of righteousness or self-righteousness came tumbling down. Like, boom. And his religiosity was just shattered to pieces. And Jesus says, as you rightly said, the one who has been forgiven much loves much. Now, Jesus wasn't suggesting that because one has been forgiven much, they should love much. But what Jesus was saying is love is born out of forgiveness. Love is born out of forgiveness. Worshipful love is the proof of forgiveness. And as one person said, let me read this quote, it's a long quote, but as one person said, you know, well, this woman got it and, and Simon missed it. Simon had the Holy One of Israel in his house, reclining at his table. The prophet Moses had foretold, uh, the, the, the prophet whom Moses had foretold of was sharing dinner with him. The Lord of glory, the resurrection and the life was speaking with him face to face. The great climactic moment of history that he claimed to be living for had arrived. He should have been deliriously, wonderfully, breathtakingly honored. To have, his, to have the Messiah in his home. But Simon was not amazed. As he looked at Jesus, all he saw was a dusty Nazarene whose claims could be interpreted as delusional. Jesus, right there in his home. And he missed it. You see, this woman realized that she was a sinner. She knew it, and the whole town knew it. And the town made sure that they reminded her over and over and over again, you're just a vile sinner. Simon thought that he was better than her. Jesus says, there's no difference between you and this woman. The only difference is she recognizes that she's a sinner. Now, I'd like to suggest something to you real quick here. This passage of Scripture suggests to me that this unnamed woman and Jesus have had an encounter sometime in the past. When Jesus forgives her, it's not just something that's happening now. Forgiveness has happened somewhere, some other day, some other place, under some other circumstance. That's why she came to the house that day, was to pour out her love and her gratitude and her worship to Jesus. Because Jesus turns around and he says to her, your sins are forgiven. Your sins are forgiven. Now what I want you to understand is this is the perfect tense, which means your sins have been forgiven and it's a continual action. Not just right now. Your sins have already been forgiven. We've already had this encounter before. Woman, you know the day and the time and the place that, where this took place. So Jesus turned around and says, your sins are forgiven. She's now saved and she's clean. And Simon, you can't stand it. It bothers you that I would turn around to this sinner and say, your sins are forgiven. It bothers you, Simon. You cannot stand to see such outrageous grace. And Simon's attitude was, I owe him nothing. And this woman's attitude was, I owe him everything. But I just want to say something real quick, and Martin was reminding us that we're living after the beautiful resurrection story. So Jesus says, your sins are forgiven. I've dealt with them. Your debt is canceled. But how is a debt truly cancelled, church? How is a debt truly cancelled? By someone incurring that debt for you, right? A debt's never truly cancelled. Somebody incurs that debt for you. If you owe me $20 and I write off the $20, I incur that debt, don't I? It doesn't just disappear. The books don't just suddenly balance themselves out. So what Jesus is saying is, I've already forgiven you. I incur that debt. And you know what, Simon? Only I can incur your debt. But you're too blinded by your own sin to be able to see that. And verse 49, And those who sat at the table with him began saying to themselves, Who is this who even forgives sins? This takes us back to the reference I used in chapter 5. Jesus heals a paralytic man, turns around and says, sons, your, your sins are forgiven. They turn around and say, what? He's just a blasphemer because only God can forgive sin. These guys are so dense, they just don't get it, right? Who is this guy who can forgive sin? Well, if he can forgive sin, he's God. That's who he is. 
But they say it with contempt. Who does he think he is to forgive sin? You still don't get it. He did it with the paralytic man and now he's doing it with the unnamed woman. It's because he's God. It's because he's Jesus. That's why only God can forgive sin. They were so blinded by their own sin that they were unable to see him for who he was. And then the scene ends with these beautiful words, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. What was it that this woman believed that made her faith a saving faith? What was it? Because remember, our, our salvation is not based on what we do. It's based on who Jesus Christ is. So what was, uh, what was it that this woman believed by faith? I believe it was the fact that she came to Jesus and in spite of her sin and in spite of her immorality and in spite of her depravity, she came to Jesus and she knew, you will not turn me away. That's the faith that I believe Jesus was talking about. She knew, you will not. I know, Jesus, you will not turn me away. And I don't know when, some other time, some other place, some other day, she went to Jesus and Jesus did not turn her away. But with arms wide open, he loved her and embraced her. And just imagine that. A woman who up until now, by just about every man in the town, had been used and abused and treated as an object. And suddenly, this beautiful Jesus comes along and treats her like a person. And Jesus says, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. And you know the beautiful thing about this, I just want to throw this out real quick and then we'll land this aircraft to the conclusion. Jesus says, go in peace. Jesus doesn't say, listen, listen, listen. Now don't go sleeping around the town. No. Now don't go living this lifestyle. Jesus doesn't need to. This woman has been transformed. This woman has been transformed by the love of Jesus. But Jesus doesn't have to lecture and say, and don't go doing what you've been doing. Jesus just says, go in peace. The story ends, and the curtain comes down, and the scene is over, and a cloud hangs over that courtyard. The contrast between the stench of sin and the saving grace of Jesus Christ. This awkward silence. So awkward. And the peasants make their way out. And they probably go gossiping in the street about what's just happened. I don't know how Simon reacts. The stench of sin and the saving grace of Jesus Christ. And friends, as we come to a close this morning, we've got to gaze into the mirror of God's Word. And as we do, let me first say this, and this might shock you. One of the things we find is we find the painful reality that oftentimes our churches are like Simon's house. Sometimes our churches are like Simon the Pharisee's house. Sometimes we're those people sitting around those, those tables looking upon people with contempt and in disgust. Believing ourselves to somehow be more worthy of the grace and love of Christ than others. And I dare say sometimes the 21st century church is like the house of a Pharisee. And so as you gaze into the mirror of God's word today, first thing we've got to ask ourselves is do I recognize my own depravity? Do I recognize that if I had this big billboard above my head that told you everything I've ever done and ever thought, that I would not show up here today? You know why the Apostle Paul, here's a quick digression, you know why the Apostle Paul says that I am the chief of sinners? Because the vilest of sinners is the person who believes that they're right when they're wrong. And Saul believed he was right. And he was persecuting the Christians. And when he finally came to the reality of the saving grace of Jesus Christ, he says, I am the chief of sinners because I thought I was so right, and yet I was so wrong. So I recognize, I gaze into the mirror of God's word, that this heart and this life is not worth loving, but Jesus still chooses to love. 
It's in recognizing as a result of that that I bring my worshipful love to Jesus and I throw myself upon His mercy because apart from His mercy, mercy, I am not worthy. And then I examine my heart and I ask myself, Darren, is there any Simon the Pharisee in your heart? Do you look upon people with disgust and contempt? Are you quick to forget your own sin but quick to remember the sins of others? Or do we love people like Jesus loves people? See, see church, here's it in a nutshell. When we understand the love of God, we will understand love for God and, and others. When we understand the love of God, we will then be in a position to see others through those same eyes uh, through which Jesus has seen us, the eyes of Jesus. And that's when God's kingdom, and we start with that first song, that's when God's kingdom becomes a reality. Is my life an expression of worshipful love toward God and Christ-like love toward others? Let's bow our heads as we pray. Father, thank you for your word. And far be it, Lord, that I would stand here and dare point fingers at anyone. That's not what I'm doing. But your word pierces the depth of my own filthy heart. And I once again throw myself upon your mercy and grace. And I thank you for your great love. And I pray, Lord, that you would teach us as a church what worshipful love, extravagant love, spendthrift love, costly love looks like as we respond to you in gratitude. As we realize what we are apart from you, Jesus. May we be a people that live lives of worshipful love where you consume us Lord where we're sold out for you Jesus and Father please forgive your church both Baptist Bible Church and the 21st century church the global church where your church has ceased in any way to be your church because it looks more like the house of a Pharisee than the house of God. And where we have judged people, and where we have criticized people, and where we have written people off, how dare we write people off in light of the cross that has written off our sin by taking it upon yourself. May we be a people that are able to see others through those very eyes through which the Savior has seen us, the eyes of Jesus. And help us to understand the great love of God so that we will demonstrate a great love for God and for others, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.